The soil test is incredibly helpful for getting a better understanding of your garden soils and what you can do to improve your soil conditions to make sure that your plants are healthy and grow successfully. I can speak to this personally because some of my gardens struggled needlessly for years when I could have just taken a little bit of time to test my soils and take some very basic actions to improve the soils that are common where I live, which are sandy and extremely acidic. It's important to get your soil tested, but sometimes it can be hard to make sense of the results. I wanted to provide you with a few tips for how to interpret your soil test so that you can get on to gardening more quickly. Here's a real life example from a garden project that I've been working on with some friends. This garden bed was neglected for at least 10 years. The arborvitae, or cedar trees, have grown way too large for the space and look awful. The burning bush shrub is overgrown, and the remainder of the bed consists of a few lilies, weeds, and some trees that have actually started growing into this space. Here's what the space looks like after the trees were cut down and turned into mulch, the tree stumps were removed, and the shrubs and plants were weeded out. It was at this point that I mailed the soil test to my state university extension office. Each state extension service or private soil lab provides soil test results that will look a little bit different. I got an email with the soil test results about a week after I mailed them in, and I'll share some of the highlights to help you understand what you're looking at. The lab will often provide contact information for you to ask questions as well. If it does, don't be shy in contacting them. The more you learn about your garden soils now, the better your garden will become over time. The first thing that I looked at was the soil type, which in this case is a loamy sand. This means that the soil is primarily a sand, but that it has some silt and clay mixed in as well. The pH, which measures acidity, is 6.4. This is good because most garden plants do best in a soil that is about 6.5 to 7.0 and near neutral. If the soil was acidic and had a pH less than 6.0 or 6.5, we would likely need to add lime to the soil in order to neutralize that acidity. If the soil was alkaline and had a pH greater than 7.5, an acidic material like sulfur could be added to lower the pH to a more desirable level. Soil tests often come with recommendations for how to add amendments to improve soil pH. The soil in this garden contains slightly more than 5% organic matter, and a value around 5% is considered very good. Given that the soil is sandy, this organic matter is important for helping the soil retain moisture. After a rain, that organic matter will soak water up and hold on to it like a sponge. If the organic matter level was lower, we would be looking to add compost or manure to increase the amount of organic matter in the soil. While no major additions of organic matter are necessary in this situation, the garden soil will still benefit from adding a bit of compost to provide additional organic matter and nutrients to the soil. Mulching the garden after it is planted will provide some material that will eventually decompose and become soil organic matter as well. The soil test also contains some information about different soil nutrients. If you have concerns about specific micronutrients, you can often pay an extra fee for a more complete analysis. This test only provided basic information. The soil test listed the values for phosphorus and potassium. Remember that these, along with nitrogen, make up the three macronutrients of N, P, and K. In this, we can see that the phosphorus levels in the soil are a touch high. Because there is adequate phosphorus, and because over-application of phosphorus fertilizer can be bad for water quality, this is an important signal to be sure not to add any phosphorus to this garden bed. Great, because that's one less thing to do. The potassium level is low, so that's something that will need to be addressed. Likewise, nitrogen is not listed here, but a fertilizer recommendation is provided later in the test results, so we can assume that it was suboptimal. Here is the fertilizer recommendation that was provided with the soil test. For every 100 square feet of garden area, we should add 0.1 pound of nitrogen, 0 phosphorus because there is plenty, and 0.5 or half pound of potassium. The report goes on to provide a few options for purchasing a fertilizer. Under option 1, if we could find a prepackaged fertilizer with a 5020 on the package for NPK, we could apply 1.5 pounds of that fertilizer to every 100 square feet of the garden. Unfortunately, no fertilizers are available with these proportions because the amount of potassium that needs to be added is so large. This is when we had to break out the calculator. We decided that we could apply two different soil amendments. We selected blood meal to provide the necessary nitrogen and green sand to provide the necessary potassium. We didn't need to add any phosphorus to our soils, but if we did, we could have used a material like rock phosphate. We needed a tenth of a pound of nitrogen for 100 square feet according to our fertilizer recommendations. However, since blood meal only contains 12% nitrogen and the remainder is other materials, we need to apply a greater amount of blood meal. When we do the math, it turns out that we need 0.83 pounds of blood meal for every 100 square feet of garden area. We can do similar calculations for the potassium. The fertilizer instructions say to add a half pound of potassium for every 100 square feet. 
Since the green sand contains 3% potassium, we'll need to apply 16.7 pounds of green sand to every 100 square feet of the garden. That's a lot of green sand. It would be okay to split that addition into two or three additions over the course of a year. Additionally, because green sand is a mineral source of potassium, it'll probably take several years for much of the potassium to be integrated into the soil and become available for plants. We measured the garden space and estimated that's about 365 square feet in area. That means that we need to apply approximately 3 pounds of blood meal and 61 pounds of green sand. Our soil test also came with a compost recommendation. Remember how I said that it's good to add compost even if you have a good amount of organic matter? If you are planning to add a substantial amount of high quality compost to your garden soil, the instructions say that you could reduce your fertilizer needs. In this case, it states that we could reduce the amount of fertilizer that we plan to add by 10% if we also apply compost. I hope that this was helpful, but if you're still feeling confused, you shouldn't be afraid to ask for help in getting recommendations for what to do in your garden. First, look to see if the university or lab that did your soil testing provides contact information for asking questions about your soil test. I know that when I received my soil test, I also received an email from a university soil scientist checking to see if I had any questions. If that doesn't work, do some online searches related to soil testing in your region to see if resources are available where you live. Or look to see if you can find a local group of master gardeners or a garden club because those individuals will be able to point you in the right direction and provide you with all sorts of information and advice.